All right, we're back. We have Travis Mills in studio, who's a... Sergeant Travis Mills, yeah. soldier. Uh, he's, he's retired now. <laughs> he was in the 82nd Airborne. He suffered a horrible accident in Afghanistan. He did a documentary called Travis, A Soldier's Story, which you could buy. Uh, where's the, what's the website, Travis? Where you uh, you that? find all that on travismills.org. There's links to it. It's coming to iTunes soon. So. Yeah. I, I mean, your documentary is incredible. We talked about Thanks. you suffering... The injuries that you suffered. You he's lost a, all four limbs. Yeah, and he's only one of five people to have survived losing all of your limbs in, in war, right? Absolutely. Uh, one of five um, from this war. There's other people that are out there that are born yeah, this way or, right. or okay. have right. horrible accidents yeah. or that it's a flu and then sepsis takes over. So I'm not like, um, it's just the, the traumatic injury of what happened to me that, that survived and then arteries and everything. So for listeners out there, on um, my left side, I have my kneecap. My right side, I'm two inches above my kneecap, so I'm considered both above knee. Uh -huh. uh, my right side, I have just like three, four inches on my arm left, so like mid bicep. Mm -hmm. And my uh, left side is a mid forearm, so I have a robotic hand and robotic knees. I drive like a normal person. Wow, everything. And, and I tell you what, I'm not. How's your driving record? It's really good. I don't get pulled over because if I do, oh, if I do, I'm just like, oh no. I never. You, you, yeah. you never have to give your wife a back massage. Uh, well, <laughs> I just still could. He I mean, could make my hand. Oh, like, you know. yeah, Somebody got... cut you off. Can you give him the finger? I was thinking about getting a tattoo on the right hand or right nose. Uh -huh. <laughs> Giving it to them. There you go. Let me let me brag about Travis real quick because okay. Travis, you were you were an athlete in high school, not just an athlete, but you were like stand a out. football standout stud. Yep. You went over, off to college and you played one season, and then yeah. you said, "This isn't for me. I'm going into military." Where you basically took over, you know, with with your squad. You, you, everybody looked towards you. You were the life of the room. Is what all your friends are saying. It's mm -hmm. not. It's, it's what they yeah. say about you. And and now you're left with without limbs. You have a little daughter, which you bring up a lot, Chloe. Yep. When when you wake up and you're told I have no more limbs, do you think about how am I going to pick my daughter up? How am I going to dance with her? What how am I going to walk down the aisle with her? Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of things that go through your head. And you're like, man, I can't do this. And then, um, you know, you you just gotta take one day at a time. There was a lot of uh, religious questions I had, like, why this happened? I pay my taxes. That you know, my wife and I bought our first house yeah. at like 23 and 21, and real, you know, a nice house, a nice yeah. neighborhood. Yeah. Um, at, at a young age, and I was like, you know, what, what, what did I do so wrong, and and why am I getting punished for this? And then you just got, you know, it was about two weeks where I was just like angry and upset, and I questioned my faith, and then it was just like, you know, that's not it. That's not the thing you got to go to. Like, you can't just be a believer when everything works. So then it was just about all, of, how am I going to get better? And Fortunately, like I, I'm not fortunate. I had such bad pain. They had to do like special studies on me, and then they put me into this ketamine coma, which is like the second person in the nation to have. It's like 600 milligrams an hour for five days straight. There's a lot of case studies on me, Whoa. and it was supposed to like reset my my brain and tolerance. And when I woke up, it was bad hallucinations. I mean, like crazy. Didn't know what was going on. Thought I was, all these different things. Ooh. But after like five days, four days of hallucinations, the fifth day, I was kind of in and out. You know, really, really getting off the medication in my body. And this guy came walking in with no arms and legs, but he's walking like how I look now. And his name was uh, Corporal Todd Nicely. He was the second one ever. And he said, hey, man, check it out. I drive. I live in Missouri with my wife. And, and I got through this, and you're going to, too. You just got to be patient. And I was like, well, that's not my virtue. I'm not, you know, uh, <laughs> patience is not what, something I'm good at. So what we're going to do is I'm going to tell the doctor I'm going to work out with you. So I fought with the doctor. I was like, I'm going to work out today. He's like, you can't. And I looked at him. I was like, Look, I'll just sit here and hurt myself with leg crunches until you let me go. I said, I'll, I even told him I'd jump on my bed and low crawl there. It was just silly. There's a wheelchair sitting right next to me. <laughs> and uh, finally, he just I called him every half hour, four hours straight. And he finally was like, fine, you can go. And uh, once I realized it could be done, it's just about getting better and, and being there for my daughter and my wife. But, I mean, when I first got to the hospital, the back before the coma, I told Kelsey, take the money that's in the account, not that as much, take Chloe, and, and don't put up with this. Like, you didn't sign up to have a husband like me. And, you know, I think she probably would have gave me a good swat if I wasn't so broken yeah. and bloody and bruised and <laughs> You basically told up. your wife, yeah. you it's okay to walk out. away if you want. I, I, you know, and I wasn't going to hold any, any grudge. I understood it. Like, I, I didn't feel like wow. I, my, my worth was, was that much anymore. Your, your motto is never give up, never quit. And that's basically your life now. I mean, you're, you're a motiv motivational speaker. You're an actor. You're doing a little bit of acting well, here you know, there. Well, man, yeah. what, have you, what have you got to speak about, dude? <laughs> that's the thing. I, don't, I, I just walk in there and I'm like, snap your fingers, wiggle your toes. And they're like, they snap and wiggle. I'm like, your life's not so bad. Then I just drop the mic and walk away. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm like, oh, wow, it must be hard. Snap and wiggle. You, you said something a while ago. You said, I was 6'3". When you're getting prosthetic legs, do they ask you, like, how tall do you want to be, or do they... I mean, they start you off. You start off with, like, 5'5", five five, like, real short, because you got to build your muscles in your core and your hips, and then you work your way up. So 6'3 is too far for me to fall, and when I stand up from a chair... Depending on how low the chair is, there's more action on my shoulder and the push down. Uh -huh. Yeah. And like a lever action from the knee, if I can right. you know, if you say that my hand's my knee, like I got to bring it up here. There's no like 
calves and okay. everything to pick me up. Right. So six foot worked out great. Isn't okay. the body an but, amazing thing? Are you just amazed by what your body can still do? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I can still... You like yeah. to buy on it? Flex them pecs. <laughs> oh, wow. Just Jenna can do that with pecs. her boots. Jenna can do that. Do no, it, Jenna. I can't. They're not real. I can't. <laughs> and the thing that's also Sorry. really incredible about your, about your story, your wife even and addressed it, that so many marriages do not survive something yeah. like this. And that's really a testament to her. Yeah. I mean, we got, you know, we were dating from just uh, her brother went home and had some pictures. She sent me my friend request. I accepted. Started chit-chatting. I was like, this girl looks pretty good. You know, had a cowgirl hat on. Uh-huh. And, skirt in her picture. I was, mm-hmm. like, I was like, hey, how are you? And then just started chit-chatting and decided, you want to you wanna meet? I'm coming home for 18 days. Let's go to Mexico. Let's go on a trip to Cozumel. Never met her. She was 18 and I was 20. By the way, you her worked parents with... parents let her? Yeah. Well, she was 18. <laughs> so yeah, she's an adult. To. I'm an adult. And her, your, your brother-in-law was, you worked with him. Like, you guys were he, yeah, he wanted to cut together. Me. He wanted to cut me. There was uh, one point where I was talking to her on Skype when I was getting ready to go home um, at, like for good and I was already dating her and met her. And I said, uh, love you, pumpkin, bye. And then hung up, and he's like, pumpkin, something my dad calls her. Uh-oh. And I looked at him, hey, Josh. Oh, boy. Calls me daddy, too. And I didn't, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean to come out wrong. He grabbed his K-bar, which is like a seven or eight-inch blade, and chased yeah. me around. He was going to cut me. Yeah. <laughs> he can't run that fast. But I, I can't now, but I could then. And he didn't catch me. But if he would have, he would have cut me, I think. But the one thing that made him punch... Like, tried to punch me. I mean, he couldn't reach my face. I was so tall. He's a real dainty-shouldered guy. <laughs> no, I love him. He's great. They're family but now. but the okay one to... thing that he got mad about was we were talking, and I think it was all building up. People are saying horrible things that me and his sister are all doing stuff, and he has to just take a whole long list of uh, razzing from everybody. And he was talking about riding horses and stuff. I said, Josh, you're, you're from Maine, really. You moved to Texas when you were in ninth grade. And also, I've been to your house at your parents'. There's another house Three feet away. I mean, it's in the suburbs, buddy. And he just looked at me. He's like, "You ever see where I work at?" And then he called me a choice of other names. And then he went to swing at me and hit my shoulder and glanced my chin. I was like, "That's what sets you off. That's what makes you punch." <laughs> but we're we're good now. We're good now. But uh, you know, with this experience, um, really had some uh, great opportunities and things. Like I didn't realize I could snowboard. Still, I didn't realize I or not still. I actually just started doing that. Yeah. Didn't realize I could go like on out in Colorado on Mount Crested Butte and like shoot down the mountain on a bike that has four wheels and my thighs just squeeze together to make the brakes. And wow. I mean, you're shooting out, and it's just you. Like, if you go off the cliff, you go off the cliff, yeah. you know? It seems like you um, had an exceptionally fast ability to adapt to the prosthetics because when you're when this happened to you, your baby wasn't even six months old, and then there's video of you celebrating her first birthday, and you're there with your limbs. It seems like it's happened so fast for you. Is it, was that because of your uh, determination? Yeah. I, I, well, I mean, uh, the hospital, when you get there, the therapist and uh, occupational and physical are just like, they've seen it before. They're, this isn't something that's new um, where they want to baby you or coddle you. And they told me that we'll work as hard as you want to work. I'm not here to be your babysitter. I'm not here to make you hmm. motivated. And um, I'm here to help you and I'll motivate you. But you have to work for it. And what they didn't know is they're signing up for uh, for some work. Because once I realized I could get better, it's just like, why wait in the hospital? You know, just let's, just let's just get this going. So I went for one hour of each a day. And then I bumped it to two and then to four of each. So I did 40 hours a week. And the worst part of my recovery, honestly, was the weekends. Um, it was truly the worst part of my uh, my whole recovery because I had to sit and not be able to go to PT and work out and get better and, and towards a, a brighter future to um, be rehab. So thanks to Walter Reed and the crazy you know things that they're able to accomplish, they, they just do amazing work up there in Maryland. And, uh, and I'm very thankful for my therapist, Carrie, and, and Joe, and my occupational therapist, and uh, you know, teaching me how to use all these tools and everything. And I studied so hard at it. The first day I got my hand, they're supposed to keep it for three days. And they let me take it home for the first like the first day. Joe's just like, I can't take your hand. You worked really hard at yeah. this. <laughs> do you lose your limbs? Like like do you you don't sleep with your legs? I heard you say that. Yeah. But like you ever wake up like I can't find my car keys or my cell phone. Like if you look for your arm, you know. No, it's it's <laughs> no, it's pretty it's pretty normal now. Um, I'm just. It's I'm not just, if you I'm, ever misplace it. Right. Right. Well, I I told the hotel um, actually in in Florida. Um, a couple weeks ago, I told the lady, I said, I lost my arm. I can't seem to find it anywhere. She's, uh-huh. I'll get security right on it right now. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm just joking. I'm, oh, that's messed I'm up. sorry. Now, this documentary was from a Kickstarter because at the end of the, the documentary, it's a whole list yeah. of names. And I'm kind of like, when you get to that point, I'm kind of halfway watching. But then I saw at the top of the screen, Troy Aikman. Yeah. How is Troy Aikman involved in this? I have no idea. <laughs> So, so, like, like, a bunch of famous people there. Yeah. Like this, and there's Troy Aikman. We were doing uh we were doing the shooting, and somebody knew somebody. So, Photolanthropy is a great, great nonprofit, and they just hit us up. Matter of fact, they're here with me today, Katie and Reese Norris, who became my, you know, two of my closest friends, our family's closest friends. And um, I, me and Reese do everything. I don't make any decision without them. But uh, you know, but anyway, so they just called, and said, "Hey, this is what we do with our nonprofit. They do amazing stories, and they want to do a 10 minute short film on my story, and then they turn it into a documentary." 
And we came out down and did some shooting. That film, the documentary, I hate to say this for everybody watches it, but it's only done five days of shooting. Really? I mean, five days of shooting on eighteen thousand dollar budget. We had like a red two lens. Like they shot the Lord of the Rings with, you know. And yeah. and uh, our our filmmaker, like that was with, behind the camera. I mean, he just all he lived down was monsters and Red Bull because we did like sixteen hours a day for four days straight. I had guys come from Fort Bragg, like got yeah. leave to come down and do this. But uh, no, it was just it's pretty incredible experience uh, that we got to do that and. I don't know where I was going with this whole entire story. Troy Aikman. Troy Aikman. Troy Aikman. Troy Aikman and That's what it was. Because it's like, man, this is such a cool experience. What were we talking about before? <laughs> but no, so they, they dirtied me up. They had me the blow-up scene. So my face is covered in blood. I had a bandage on my arm with fake blood on it, and I was all mangled, and he comes walking in. Troy. At the end of like, that shooting, I was like, I would shake your hand with my hand, but I guess you get this fake buddy dirty you know, nub in me. And he's just like, hey, man, what's up? We got a picture. It's actually a picture in the end. Yeah. Isn't and, he dreamy? Uh, Come on, Travis. Even you have to admit oh, that. I had like hearts just beating out of my Serious? <laughs> 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 you have a you had a quote in your in your documentary where you said, you know, we were still fighting because it was 2012. And yeah. we're still out there fighting and people have no idea that it's still going on, that people know everything that's going on with Brangelina, but they have no idea what's going on with us mm-hmm. overseas. Yeah. Do you think that's the case still now in 2015? I mean, yeah, but we are doing more what we said we were going to do. I think after our uh, our wave went, because we were hit really hard, yeah. it was a really bad year for 2012 for, for guys with injuries. But now I think it's more like um, Afghan um, National Army and Afghan National Police are leading more of the charge, mm-hmm. and we're doing um, just the same amount of work, but they're they're taking over. But uh, no, they don't they don't cover everything. They, they want to cover everything that's negative. It's not like we're building a school or helping these, these little children that are girls go to school and they have an education instead of being... You know, put fifteen uh, fifteen yards behind their their husband and getting smacked around, you know, and things like that. So they don't cover everything they need to cover, I don't think. But you know, they had to have good publicity. But um, I enjoyed my time overseas. I enjoyed everything. I went the first time because for the experience. Second time was for my guys. The third time was definitely for my guys. I had the option to get out of that deployment. I actually it was not option. It was I was supposed to get out to yeah. go to a new unit and build another brigade and be a combat in, uh, non commissioned officer there. They wanted experience, and I said, you know, that's not really for me. I just got to go on this deployment. So I, I did that, you know, and um, that's just kind of how it worked. I, I was very, very thankful to be able to be a part of the 82nd Airborne Division, the greatest division in the world. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I jumped out of airplanes for uh, for work. It was a thrill. And, and then um, I actually learned I got to go to school to become a jump master. Mm-hmm. So that's when you do, like, your checks and, like, you're yeah. in charge of the jump. You're like, okay, green light, you jump. Like, I just checked your equipment, your line, everything's all your trust is in me because mm-hmm. I went to this, you know, school. So... I've had two guys at the door say they're not going to go. The one kid I picked up by the back of his shirt, back of his pants, and said, you are going. Oh. And then the other kid I kicked in the back. Oh. <laughs> you know, yeah. in, the, in the brief, you have to say, like, you'd be told green light, go. And you get three commands on a third command. If you do not exit the aircraft, you'll be unhooked and set down the tailgate. We'll exit real paratroopers. And then this is in the whole pre-brief. But I stopped right there every time I did the brief and said, but trust me, if I say green light, go, and, this, and when you're expecting for the second one, you're getting thrown out. I said nobody's going to be a, a not jump or a non exit today. I bet that's not the word you used. Yeah, probably not. No, yeah, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> probably not. There's a lot of other choice words in the military that you use.